Good afternoon. On behalf of the people of St. Peter's, I welcome you to this three hour service in which we come and sit and kneel before the cross, and gather with the women and the beloved disciple who watched and waited for him at this time. The service follows a rhythm, a pattern. We will read a psalm, reflect, and then take a period of silence. This, each sitting will be about seven minutes long. And I'd encourage you when we read the Psalms uh, to actually stand up just to give your body a break so that you can release some of the tension just that comes from sitting. And we will continue that cycle as we reflect on the last seven words of Jesus from the cross. Blessed be our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Save me, O God, for the waters have risen up to my neck. I am seeking in deep mire, and there is no firm ground for my feet. I have come into deep waters, and the torrent washes over me. I have grown weary with my crying. My throat is inflamed. My eyes have failed from looking for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than hairs of my head. My lying foes who would destroy me are mighty. Must I then give back what I never stole? O oh God, you know my foolishness and my faults are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you to be disgraced because of me, O God of Israel. Surely for your sake have I suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting but that was turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also and became a byword among them. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, this is my prayer to you at the time you have set, O Lord. In your great mercy, O God, answer me with your unfailing help. Save me from the mire, do not let me sink. Let me be rescued from those who hate me out of the deep waters. Let not the torrent of waters wash over me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Do not let the pit shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, turn to me. Our first meditation is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You take a moment to imagine the scene. Jesus is being nailed to the cross. You can hear the pounding of the nails. And what does Jesus do in the midst of that Rather than focusing on his own horror and on his own pain at that moment, he cries these incredible words, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. 
In fact, we could go on to say they haven't even got a clue what they're doing in this moment. I know in the course of my ministry, helping people to forgive has been a huge part of that work. But I also think in terms of self-forgiveness. How do we forgive ourselves? We can come back to Jesus. What does Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And what we see in this cry of Jesus from the cross is one of the root causes of humanity's problem and our problem is pure ignorance, that we really have no clue what we're doing. And you can go back and think of some of those times for which you're ashamed. And to be aware that really the problem that you were having was one of ignorance. If you had known how to do better, I'm pretty sure you would have done better. And that ignorance in this point is broader than just simple intellectual understanding. Ignorance is also context dependent. I think of, for example, why normally honest people will often lie. And you think of the times when they lie, it's because at that moment, that's the best thing they know how to do they possibly become afraid. And in that fear-driven context, the best they know how to do is to lie. Now, I'm not agreeing with the strategy or saying that that's right. I'm just aware that that is what is. And one of my fundamental beliefs about all of us, our human experience, is that at any given moment, we're doing the best we know how to do in that current context. And even in some of the most heinous situations that we may read about, and think of some of the incredible things that people have done, wicked things that people have done, in that given moment, that is the best they knew how to do. And that is a really, really sad thing, that that's the best they know how to do. Would that they would have known how to do something a whole lot better. But in that moment, that was the best they knew how to do. And maybe it was the best they knew how to do to get revenge. Because revenge was what they had been taught. And just because we've been taught something doesn't make it right. What we have here is ignorance. And I think of the calamities of war that the nations in the world have gone through. The calamity of human ignorance. And I know having led services for veterans and were war memorials, big, huge war memorials where there's just row after row of cross and star. You stand in the midst of all of these often young people who have died. And one of the things that I find myself just becoming profoundly aware of is a sadness. And the sort of the thought in my heart is, when, when will we ever learn? When will humanity learn that this is not right? This going off to war of killing one another, that killing cannot be a solution to any problem. And when you look at human history, 
you can step back and say, whoa, aren't we incredibly slow learners? Do we have to continue to repeat these patterns over and over and over again and never learn? And so as we begin this three hours, we also think of Jesus. He came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, to proclaim a new way of being, a new way of living in the world. And in most cases, what he encountered was incredible ignorance. And that ignorance led to people nailing him on a cross. So as we prepare for our first silence today, I invite you to take a moment and whatever situation in the world that may come to your mind, to step back from it and pay attention to how ignorance is paying a part, and often a huge part, in how we respond. And also, if thoughts of your own life come into focus, Be aware of your own ignorance. And this is not to excuse the behavior that we or others may do that we find really offensive. But what we can do is to take responsibility for our ignorance and ask that experience to teach us what to do differently. And above all else, to ask ourselves, what would love, what would love teach me to do differently that I would not act so ignorantly in the future? We now begin our first silence. I'll say the antiphon and then I'll ring the bell and we'll keep silence for about seven minutes. And then I'll ring the bell again and we will repeat the antiphon. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. I have become important to many, but you are my refuge and my strength. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Do not cast me off in my old age. Forsake me not when my strength fails. For my enemies are talking against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together. They say, God has forsaken him. Go after him and seize him, because there is none who will save. O oh God, be not far from me. Come quickly to help me, O oh my God. Let those who set themselves against me be put to shame and be disgraced. Let those who seek to do me evil be covered with scorn and reproach. But I shall always wait in patience and shall praise you more and more. My mouth shall recount your mighty acts and saving deeds all day long, though I cannot know the number of them. I begin with the mighty works of the Lord God. I will recall your righteousness, yours alone. O oh God, you have taught me since I was young, and to this day I tell of your wonderful works. And now that I am old and grey-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me, till I make known your strength to this generation and your power to all who are to come. Your righteousness, O oh God, reaches to the heavens. You have great done great things. Who is like you, O oh God? You have showed me with great troubles and adversities. But you will restore my life and bring me up again from the deep places of the earth. You strengthen me more and more. You unfold and comfort me. Therefore, I will praise you upon the lyre for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing to you with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will sing with joy when I play to you, and so will my soul, which you have redeemed. My tongue will proclaim your righteousness all day long, for they are ashamed and disgraced who sought to do me harm. A second meditation. Woman, here is your son. Son, here is your mother. I don't know where you go to when you experience personal pain and suffering. Typically, I become very self-preoccupied and just concerned with my own pain and suffering, almost to the point that I give up caring for other people. I can recall, for example, being on a small yacht and we were get going, getting ready to go racing and we had luffed up our sails just to, so we didn't cross the start line before we were allowed to. And the boat was just wallowing in the water. And I got incredibly, incredibly seasick. And I can remember just being utterly, utterly miserable. And I didn't care whether the boat sank. I didn't care at that moment for the people on the boat. All I wanted 
was my suffering to end. And so what that suffering at that point did for me is it brought me to a place of just total self-preoccupation. And here in the midst of thinking about Jesus on the cross and these three hours he spent nailed to the cross, what we see is Jesus being aware of those who are suffering because of his suffering, of Mary, his mother, and the beloved disciple. Story has it that everybody else scattered, but in the midst of the suffering and the pain of the situation, people just departed, except for Mary, the beloved disciple, and several other women. And in the midst of that, Jesus sees these people that he cares about, these people that he loves dearly, his mother, his beloved disciple. And we have these incredible words. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Take care. Take care of these people that you care about. And we see Jesus at that point reaching out way beyond himself in love to the people that he loves. And so as we contemplate this, we can think about the people in our life who are suffering. And those people who are suffering and our desire to help them. And I think probably one of the worst experiences that we can have in those situations is to see someone suffering, see someone that we really love suffering and are often powerless to do anything about it. And all we can do is to be like Mary and John, to sit, to kneel, to wait, to wait with, knowing the outcome isn't going to be good at all, totally unwanted. And yet in the midst of that, we sit. And we wait. And I think it's in those moments of powerlessness to change the suffering of others that we often can feel incredibly overwhelmed. And I can think of a couple of occasions in my own life when that has happened. And it's in those moments that we become one with all the suffering in the universe. I can think of one time in particular being so conscious of all of that suffering in the world, but not just the human world, but the whole of creation. And it was like in that moment I could hear the tectonic plates grinding against one another. Or I could hear the incredible roar of a hurricane and the violence of the storm. Or I could think of volcanoes. And the incredible pounding of waves against rocks. And St. Paul talks about creation. The whole of creation is groaning and waiting for the children of God. And so as we 
are aware of suffering and our own personal suffering. It's not just that we suffer. And yet that's often the experience we have that we're the only person in the world. But in that, our suffering, we have become one with all the suffering in the universe. We think of countless people today, right at this moment, whose hearts are heavy, whose physical bodies are racked with pain. And people who have been so oppressed through the course of their life that they've grown weary to the point of almost giving up, if not giving up. This is the suffering of the world, the suffering of all of creation. And this is the suffering that Jesus didn't run from, that Jesus actually embraced and lived into it became one with it. And this incredible story of the Son of God becoming a human being, living as one of us, and knowing suffering. And particularly in this moment, we think of a mother, a parent, watching child die. The enormous heartache that brings. To watch your own flesh and blood die. So as we begin another period of silence, I invite you to be aware of the things that cause you suffering. And the things that cause suffering in the world. More so the people who are actually in the midst of that suffering. We see Jesus' response to it. A sign of love, an act of joining with it. To know that Jesus joins with you in your suffering, the suffering of all the world, the suffering and groaning of all of creation. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me, and I will make me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. Sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Be favorable and gracious to Zion and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with the appointed sacrifices, with burnt offerings and oblations. Then shall they offer young bullocks upon your altar. Our third meditation, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We remember the two thieves who were crucified with Jesus. And in the midst of their pain and suffering, one of them turned to Jesus and said, you know, if you really are the son of God, why don't you get us all down off here? Save yourself and save us while you're about it. And the other turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded to him saying, today you will be with me in paradise. And the word paradise brings to my mind the very beginning of the Holy Scriptures when we hear the story of creation and the man and the woman were in paradise. A place free from pain and suffering. A place free from toil and tribulation. And I... Think about those days, what that would be like. And I'm very aware that in the midst of paradise, the man and the woman were given a job to do. They were to tend the garden. They were to tend creation and take care of it. They had responsibility for the whole of creation. And sometimes work can become incredible drudgery to the point that we'd love to give up work. 
And if you think that paradise is a place where you don't have to work, you're sorely misguided. Because in paradise, the man and the woman had a job to do. They had work to do. And then what we see in that is that work is part of human dignity. It's an essential part of human dignity. To be able to, the ability to do something and to contribute to the well-being of others, the people around us. And you can watch people who have worked and lose their job and to seek work and not find it. And how very quickly that can become soul destroying and rob people of their dignity. That work is an essential part of human dignity. But we see in the story of creation that something happens. And we see that what they desired was to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It reminds us of the first meditation. We thought about ignorance and the desire to gain wisdom. The people became ignorant. And in this credible story of creation and the fall, we have the consequence of the fall. Now, I have no idea what caused the fall. There's no simple, rational explanation. I think the whole story in Genesis is really an explanation, not of the cause, but is it really a description, maybe better than an explanation, of our human predicament. When we ponder an incredible loving God, and yet what we do is know so much suffering and pain. And how can this be? And this awareness in the people of God that something has fundamentally gone wrong. The exact nature of what caused that is beyond us. But we see the consequence of it. And one of those things that we are aware of is this incredible sense of being forsaken. We're not aware of God's presence. But we'll come back to that in a bit. Because what we also are often aware of in our daily life is this incredible consequence that work, which was supposed to be part of our essential dignity, has become toil. And that we end up spending a lot of our day struggling with the thorns and the thistles and the weeds, and that work has become toil. Now, you've had those days when you've maybe got in the flow and you've done your work. And in that flow state, it just seems that it is effortless and you're not struggling. And you may actually go to bed that night exhausted. But you're physically tired, but emotionally, you're ready to wake up and do it all again. But you've also probably had the experience of struggling and toiling to no avail. And at the end of the day, being defeated. And you can go to bed exhausted and not even caring whether you wake up the next day. And so for many people, work has become toil and drudgery. And when we think about redemption, Jesus came to redeem the world and has invited us to be part of that work of redemption. I think one of the places that we really need to redeem is our workplace, the places where we work. So that working is not just a way to make money, 
but as actually an expression of our essential, essential dignity. And I think people struggle with that. And some of the times when I can think, for example, of one of the expressions, people care about their employees and they will say, our people are our number one resource. And that may sound really good until you reflect on what we do with our resources. What we do with our resources, we mine them, we rip them off, we sell them, we trade them, we exploit them, then we discard them. So I'm not sure that I really want to be a resource or even to think of another human being as a resource. We are way, way more than that. You think of other words that come to mind. The word that I like, but I realize it also has some baggage, is to think of people as treasures. Now, I know we rip off and steal the treasures of the world. But I think of the idea of being treasured, of being cherished. What would happen if our workplaces were places where people were treasured and cherished? I think we would actually begin to experience some of that paradise that the story, the words of Jesus bring us back to the idea of being in paradise where we know a couple of things. In paradise where we know the very presence of God. Not only do we know the presence of God, but that we have meaningful work, that we have a responsibility to care for. And so as we begin our next silence, I invite you to think in those areas of your life where you need to know paradise. And often what we need to do to experience paradise, that sense of relief, is for our egos to let go of the outcome. When we want things to be just so, to be totally right, to be perfect, particularly that they would be perfect so we would gain approval, perhaps by a boss, by somebody else that we value or whose opinion we value. Because in paradise, what we do is we do the things that we do because they're right things to do. We don't do them to gain approval. We do them because it's good to do them. And to let go of our ego is attachment to outcomes, particularly for the desire for approval. And for many people, it would actually be a whole lot better if they actually went to work and worked for money rather than worked for the approval of others. And so I invite you to think about how work has become toil, drudgery. And 
what would it take to redeem your work situation? Or perhaps if you're the boss of somebody, what do you need to do to redeem the people who report to you? That the people under your care would be treasured, cherished, delighted in. And that you would be giving them back their dignity. For then you will have created a little bit of paradise. For the people entrusted to your care. Let us take some time in silence. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Lord, hear my prayer, and in your faithfulness heed my supplications. Answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for in your sight shall no one living be justified. For my enemy has sought my life. He has crushed me to the ground. He has made me live in dark places like those who are long dead. My spirit faints within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the time past. I muse upon all your deeds. I consider the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul gasps to you like a thirsty land. O oh Lord, make haste to answer me. My spirit fails me. Do not hide your face from me, or I shall be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear of your loving kindness in the morning, for I put my trust in you. Show me the road that I must walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord, for I flee to you for refuge. Teach me to do what pleases you, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring me out of trouble. Of your goodness, destroy my enemies and bring all my foes to naught. For truly, I am your servant. Our fourth meditation, I thirst. We think of Jesus on the cross, not only the agony, the physical agony of being nailed to a cross or bleeding, that inner agony of thirst of being incredibly parched, dry. I thirst. And I think of thirsting and I will say that I don't think in any time of my life have I ever actually thirsted because I was desperately, desperately parched. And I've got hot and exhausted and just long for something to drink. And the good news is, is that in all those occasions, water or some other beverage was at hand. So I, I don't know what it is to really be in a place of physical thirsting, of being dry to the bone, of being absolutely parched, and the pain of that. I know there are many people in the world that don't have adequate water and often thirst. But that's something that personally I only know in abstract. But I do wonder and think about thirst from the perspective of an incredible longing. And so as I listen to these words, I thirst. I wonder what it is that I thirst for in my life. What I long for. What my heart feels parched for. And I wonder, what do you thirst for in your life? What is your desperate longing
What do you long for that you do not have? <clears throat> And I think of the different things that people do thirst for. I think, for example, and we talked about it in the previous meditation, of thirsting for approval, longing, and thinking if you could just get one word of approval from a special person in your life, it would make everything different. I think of people who thirst for money or thirst for power. Or thirst for companionship. Because all they know is loneliness. So I wonder, I wonder what it is that you thirst for. And I wonder what the solution to that thirst is. Because often when we think of thirsting, it's just like, well, as long as we can get some water, it'd be fine. And in most cases, it is. And so it would seem that the answer to our thirst is to get what it is we're looking for. But in my experience, those things that I've thirsted for, that often when I've got them, things like approval, they're very momentary. And before long, I know I'm back out there looking for it again. And that none of those things that we might get, if we thirst for money, how much money? Are we really thirsting for? And when is enough? How do you make that decision? When is enough? Because I, from my experience, the people who thirst for money, that thirst is endless. No amount of money will actually satisfy it. Quench it. Just as no amount of approval will quench the thirst for approval. Just sets you up needing it again. And of all the other things that you may thirst for, what really satisfies? And we're often taught, be careful what you wish for. Because people have discovered when they finally get what they wish for, instead of becoming as a blessing, it becomes just an incredible curse. So what truly satisfies the thirsts, and particularly the thirsts of our heart? And the answer that we have The answer that we see on the cross today. The answer to all of these thirsts is God, God's self, God's relationship. To know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are loved. And beyond just loved, but that you know in your being the presence of God. And you don't need to run around seeking approval when you know in the depths of your being the presence of God. And it's not simply that you've got God's approval, but that 
actually you no longer need approval for all these other things that you may thirst for. In the gospel, Jesus tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be given to you, all these things that you thirst for. You may find that you're really not that interested in them. And so what is this kingdom of God that Jesus calls us to seek? We often think of this kingdom of God that's something to come in the future. But Jesus was always saying the kingdom of God is here, it's present. The kingdom of God is wherever God reigns. It is coming in its fullness, but it's right here, right with you, this moment. You don't have to seek any further. It is here. And it's in the kingdom of God that is right now. That the thirst of your heart will be quenched. And that struggle, that toil we talked about will be over. And so as we prepare to take some more silence and enter into the silence, I wonder what it is that you really, really thirst for. And maybe one of the ways to find that out is to ask yourself the question or fill in the blank of the sentence I will be happy when and just fill in the blank what did you put I will be happy when and if you notice there if you put anything in that space I can guarantee you, you will never be happy. Because what you've done is made happiness a future event. Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. But what are you going to do in the meantime? And my experience is that what we are often doing is we're saying, I'll be happy when, and so in my misery, I will pursue that thing. And when you're in a miserable state, you're not very creative. I remember I used to say, you know, I'll be happy when I'm married. Well, I became such a miserable person that nobody would ever want to marry me. That wasn't a very good strategy. So what did you put? I will be happy when. And the solution to that dilemma is to actually give up wanting and to say, it is with happiness I will pursue whatever it is that you wanted. And I would suggest as we enter into this period of silence that you can ponder. If you're saying, I'll be happy when, and Seriously, if you could achieve that when in the next five minutes, rather than sit in silence, go do it. But if there's actually nothing you can do in the next five minutes to achieve whatever you're saying, I'll be happy when, then you could sit in happiness and wait with happiness. And that may sound rather simplistic, but it actually becomes a habit of the heart, of waiting with happiness. It comes from surrendering our attachment to these things that we think will make 
us happy. And when I was learning the, the way of happiness, a couple of places that I found really helpful to teach me the way of happiness. One was in supermarkets. Um, for whatever reason, maybe it's karma or something, but when I'm in a supermarket and there's lines of people waiting to check out, um, I'll choose the shortest line and sure as eggs, I get into that line and find someone's lost their credit card or something else has happened or they need to, they can't find a SKU number on one of the items and they've got people running around. And so this short line that I was in would end up becoming the longest line. And I can remember on several occasions, going, oh, I'll be happy when I get out of the supermarket, get home. And to catch myself and say, nope, it is with happiness that I will wait for my turn to check out. And the other place in I, when I was learning the way of happiness was in um, Buena Park in Southern California. And we have lots of streets down there that four lane streets with lights everywhere. And often I'm always running a little bit late and sure as eggs, I can be and be running late and I would hit every red light going down the road. <laughs> and to get to the light, you know, oh, I'll be happy when the light turns green. <laughs> to catch myself and practice. No, it is with happiness that I will wait for the light to turn green. Now, while we're talking about happiness and wanting and giving up wanting, is the solution. If you really want to maximize, supersize your misery, here's a really cool way to do it. Go back to, I will be happy when. And in that when, check it out. Put, I will be happy when. Make it, somebody else changes their behavior. And particularly if you pick on a person who really doesn't care about you, done you dirty. And you're saying, you know, I will be happy when that person changes. You could be in for an incredibly long life of misery if that's what you've done. That's a really, really cool way to be miserable. And what you can do at that point is to stop and say, hmm, how do I want to wait until this person wakes up and changes? Chances are they're not going to change. And I can guarantee you they won't change because you're miserable. That's not an effective strategy to get people to change in my experience. So what you want to do is to ponder, how do you want to wait until that person changes? And so when I listen to Jesus saying, I thirst, I'm reminded of those things that I thirst for. And then the way I attribute that if I actually achieve those things, that will bring happiness. And I've discovered that ain't true at all. But the real key to happiness is to give up wanting. So as we enter our silence, I invite you to ponder, how do you fill in the blank? I will be happy when. And to contemplate, what would it be like to pursue that goal, that objective, beginning with happiness rather than making happiness the end? We adore you, O Christ. And we bless you because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praise of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help me. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of bash and surround me. They open wide their jaws at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in. And gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord. You that fear him, stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praises of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. And those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations bow down before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has undone. Our fifth meditation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?
For me, these words of Jesus from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I'm not sure that they're words so much as a scream, a yell in agony of someone who feels utterly, utterly bereft and forsaken. For me, these words, this scream, are the most powerful in the whole of the scriptures. These words are the reason that I remain a Christian. I wonder why. When we think about the incarnation that God sent his son into the world to live as one of us, What I find incredible in that whole idea of God becoming a human being and living as one of us is when I think about it, I am not really that interested in worshiping a God, following a God, believing in a God who would be up in heaven somewhere and peer out over humanity and say, Rob, be a good boy. And who has absolutely no idea of what it's like to be a human being. I think of what is it that we go through as human beings? We experience suffering. We experience pain. We experience rejection. And the one thing I think that is the most excruciating that we go through is the sense of being separated from God, of being abandoned by God. And I know, for me, that the cry that's at the very depths of my being, the depths of my soul, the human agony or existential agony is to feel forsaken by the one who made me, by the one who proclaims to love me. And so this cry of Jesus from the cross is the cry of my own heart. And because the Son of God has cried that cry, I know that God knows what it's like to be a human being, what it's like to be me. And that is why I continue to follow Christ. Because Christ is the God who knows what it's like to be utterly bereft. And this cry takes us back to the other aspect of paradise. We talked about paradise as being a place where we have work to do. We're given dignity. But the other thing paradise had was that in the cool of the evening, God would come down and hang out with the man and the woman. And the great consequence of the fall the expulsion from paradise was this awareness, the sense that we have been expulsed from the garden, that we've been sent away from the very presence of God, that we are alienated from God. And the whole idea of redemption and salvation is to be restored. the presence of God, to be in that place where God is present. And so when I think of paradise, paradise is the place where we know the presence of God. <laughs> when we're thinking about what we thirst for, 
I think in the very depths of all of our thirst is that cry, that longing, that thirst, hunger, for an awareness of the presence of God. And that most of the time when we suffer, that's the first thing we seem to lose, is an awareness of God's presence. And yet when we suffer, what we see is Jesus on a cross. And it seems almost ironic in those moments of suffering, particularly if you have known the love of God at some point in the time of your life. And you try to do what you think God wants. And somehow it all comes to a screaming crash and it doesn't work out. You may end up fired. You may end up divorced, losing a loved one. All the way you thought life would work is just taken away from you. Or you may have all of those things, and yet for some inexplicable reason, just totally, absolutely miserable. And some may say, well, it's just your chemistry and you need this drug or that drug or what have you. And if we just get those all sorted out, happiness will return. I think for many people, those medications may be helpful. But they take the edge off that misery. They don't take it away. And it may make life livable. But what you know and live is the sense of being utterly forsaken, bereft of the presence of God. And that in that moment, nothing makes sense. We think of Jesus. He came. He proclaimed the kingdom. He did incredible miracles. He knew God was real. He could see it and invited his disciples into that reality, and they too believed. And yet here he is, betrayed, crucified, in utter agony. Mocked and scorned, rejected. And dying. I want a God who understands what that's like. Now I haven't been hung on a cross. But I do wonder about dying sometimes. And depending on the day, that can scare the living bejabbers out of me. I think, though, of those other times in my life and the life of the people I know, when nothing's working and everything you do to try to make it better just makes it worse and it gets worse and worse to get to that place of being utterly hopeless and you can't see a future. Well, the only future you can see is just more endless days like that day. 
That is a really miserable place to be. And like Jesus at that point, we get to our wit's end with absolutely no understanding that this God who we have known seems to have abandoned us. And so that cry that just comes out of the very depths of our heart is a cry that Jesus cries. And for me, this is the high point of the gospel, the high point of the whole Jesus story. That Jesus knows what it's like to feel utterly abandoned by God. And so as we sit in silence again. I invite you to be aware of those places in your life where you feel abandoned. And in the midst of that abandonment, To hear Jesus cry the cry that's in the very depths of your heart. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that you have secretly set for me. For you are my tower of strength. To your hands I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. I hate those who cling to worthless idols, and I put my trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad because of your mercy, for you have seen my affliction. You know my distress. You have not shut me up in the power of the enemy. You have set my feet in an open place. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten, like a dead man, out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd. Fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant and in your loving kindness save me. Lord, let me not be ashamed for having called upon you. Rather, let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be silenced, which speak against the righteous, haughtily, disdainfully, and with contempt. How great is your goodness, O Lord, for which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have done in the sight of all for those who put their trust in you. You hide them in the covert of your presence from those who slander them. You keep them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his love and of a siege city. Yet I said in my alarm, I have been cut off from the sight of your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the sound of my entreaty when I cried out to you. Love the Lord, all you who worship him. The Lord protects the faithful, but repays to the full those who act haughtingly. Be strong. And let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. The sixth meditation. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I find this saying of Jesus from the cross to be incredibly paradoxical, particularly in light of the previous words he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I find it paradoxical because he has just cried out in agony that God has forsaken him. And the next thing he does puts his hands, his life in the hands of this God 
he does not understand. And I would think of this verse actually as probably the greatest act of faith in the entire scriptures. To surrender his life at that moment to the one who he doesn't understand. I'm reminded of the disciples when Jesus had been teaching and had said a whole bunch of things that people took offense at and they all scattered and wondered. And Jesus looked at the disciples and said, where are they going? Are you going as well? And Peter said, where could we go? You have the words of life. And I think of that in the light of this passage here, when it's kind of, you feel utterly abandoned by God. But where else is there to go? There is nowhere else to go. And things at that moment are incredibly dark. There is no light at all. And all you can do is entrust yourself into the God who doesn't seem to understand. John of the Cross, a great Spanish mystic, calls this the dark night of the soul. And what John talks about in his writings, he says there are actually two awakenings in our life. When we get born again, we come to this awareness of the knowledge of God. And that's the first understanding of the nature of God. And typically what happens is that awakening occurs often in our life. We may be biffing along and we've got a plan. We know what it's going to take to make us happy. And we go biffing along, pursuing that, and something happens and it all comes to a screeching halt. In the midst of our agony at that moment, we cry out to God. And we often discover God in those situations. And one of the things that will often happen is that we will think, hmm, now I understand. God is going to make my plan for happiness work. Well, oh, got some news for you. God is not too interested in your plan for happiness because God's too busy working on God's plan for your happiness. And we think that God is here to do our bidding and our understanding of God. And our understanding of God may also be contaminated by all sorts of other things. I think about the society we live in today. There are so many gods wandering around in our world. And so many people doing so much stuff in Jesus' name that is so far from Jesus that it makes me want to shudder. And so what ends up happening for a lot of people is this first understanding of the nature of God comes to a screeching end. And often that first understanding of the nature of God has an underbelly of fear. And we may get tired of living in fear. And that way of living in fear with a God who evokes fear just finally gets to the place it doesn't work. And when that doesn't work, you are likely to feel utterly abandoned. And that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, rings so true. Because you have been forsaken by that God that actually doesn't even exist. And the problem is that when we're in the midst of that, the new understanding of God has not taken shape in consciousness. And this is what John of the Cross 
would call the dark night of the soul, where everything that you understand, everything that you can imagine and think about God and your whole understanding of you and God and how all that works together, all of it just disappears and no longer works. We think, for example, of St. Paul on the Damascus Road. He's bipping along. His understanding of God says that I have to destroy Christianity. He has a map and an understanding of who God is. And that all comes to a screeching halt. And for a period of time, he has no way to understand God and reality. The scriptures tell us that he was blind. He could not see. And it took some days for a new awareness of the nature of God to take shape in consciousness. And it's that period between the old God dying and you seeing the new God clearly. It's not only the old God dying, but it's your old self dying and all that it understands. But the new awareness of who you are and who God really is hasn't taken shape in consciousness. And at that moment, it is dark. It is black. But all you can do is simply entrust yourself to the darkness, to the God that is both beyond the darkness and in the darkness. And so I see Jesus doing that. And this, when he says, into your hands, I commend my spirit. A humble letting go of all that you imagine to be true, all that you know, and surrendering yourself into the presence of God. Now, I know that that can be incredibly scary to get to that place. It's like you're walking down a road and particularly if the old God is a God that evokes a lot of fear, of punishment, of hellfire and damnation, retribution, punishment. You will get to this fork in the road and that fork will have, one fork will go off, I'll call it the path of fear. The other fork is the path of love. The path of fear in some ways is predictable because it says if you do this, this thing will happen. If you don't do this, then other things will happen. It's very predictable in some ways. And it can be enormously scary at that point when you're in the midst of the dark night to just want to go back to how things were when things seem kind of predictable. And when you walk that path into the path of love, it may be a little daunting at first, a little scary. Because what you're doing at that moment is entrusting yourself to the God who loves totally independent of anything you can do. And if it's, in, if it's totally independent of anything that you can do, it is totally out of your control. You can't control your own destiny at that point. You never have been able to. But we have the illusion of it and giving up that illusion can be incredibly scary. And so you surrender yourself into the darkness 
trusting in the God whose essence, whose very being is love. And what happens in those moments when we surrender, we let go of our own understanding. We experience the peace of God, which passes all understanding. We experience not only the peace of God, we experience the presence of God. And the light begins to shine in that darkness. And the darkness is not overcome it. light shines. And thanks be to God, it never goes out. And so as we prepare to be silent, I invite you to surrender yourself into the goodness of God. Not trying to figure out what that goodness is, but simply to know that it's from God and it is good. It will be good for you and it will be good for those whom you love. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I waited patiently upon the Lord. He stooped to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the desolate pit, out of the mire and clay. He set my feet upon a high cliff and made my footing sure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and stand in awe and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are they who trust in the Lord. They do not resort to evil spirits or turn to false gods. Great things are they that you have done, O Lord, my God. How great your wonders and your plans for us. There is none who can be compared with you. Oh, that I could make them known and tell them, but they are more than I can count. In sacrifice and offering you take no pleasure. You have given me ears to hear you. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And so I said, Behold, I come. In the roll of the book it is written concerning me, I love to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is deep in my heart. I proclaimed righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I did not restrain my lips, and that, O oh Lord, you know. Your righteousness have I not hidden in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your deliverance. I have not concealed your love and faithfulness from the great congregation. You are the Lord. Do not withhold your compassion from me. Let your love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. For innumerable troubles have crowded upon me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more in number than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and altogether dismayed who seek after my life to destroy it. Let them draw back and be disgraced who take pleasure in my misfortune. Let those who say, aha, and gloat over me be confounded because they are ashamed. Let all who seek you rejoice in you and be glad. Let those who love your salvation continually say, Great is the Lord. Though I am poor and afflicted, the Lord will have regard for me. You are my helper and my deliverer. Do not tarry, O oh my God. Our seventh meditation, it is finished. So, what did you expect Jesus to accomplish? What do you think Jesus' mission, what do you think Jesus' task was? Because whatever it was, whatever you think it is, it is finished. There is nothing more to do. He has come and been who he was and did what he did. And nothing more is needed. Now, we call him many things, Savior, Redeemer, Messiah, Teacher, all sorts of names that we ascribe to him, all sorts of responsibilities and actions. What did he come to do? And the way we understand that is often very contextual and depending on the culture that we live in. Uh, we can think of Jesus as being a sacrifice for sin. 
And particularly that makes sense if you're in a culture where people make sin offerings. We could think of Jesus, the firstborn, sacrificed. And I have a good friend, Dr. Bob Cooley, who I met in Charlotte. And he had spent, oh, a big, big hunk of his life digging holes all over Egypt, Palestine, Israel, doing biblical archaeology. And he did a lot of research on Canaanite homes. And he said what he found in the foundation, in the cornerstone of many of these Canaanite homes was an infant child. It was the firstborn sacrificed. And when we hear that Jesus is the cornerstone, we're hearing an echo of that. But that's that culture. And so in that culture, you could understand Jesus from that perspective. Or, and I think of some work that folks at Fuller Theological Seminary did in their School of Missiology, what they would do is go to different nations, different cultures, and they would listen and ask to hear the stories of redemption and reconciliation, of treaties, of covenants, how people organize that. In part of Africa, there were several tribes that the way they entered into treaties with other tribes in their vicinity is that if they'd been warring and then they decided to have a treaty, to have peace, that the chiefs of these tribes would trade elder sons. The firstborn would go and live with the chief of the other tribe and vice versa. And that you wouldn't attack the tribe because the son was there and would likely be killed. And what they could do, the missionaries would do, is take some of those local metaphors for redemption and then talk about our relationship with God and how Jesus was the perfect answer to the solution that we struggle with or the problem that we struggle with in our relationship with God. And so our understanding of God, our understanding of Jesus and what Jesus did, I think has a huge cultural element because we're trying to explain something that's beyond words. We know somehow in Jesus. It is finished. And that Jesus is the perfect answer for whatever we think is the problem that we have in our relationship with God. When I look back in the story of Genesis, I've talked about creation, the consequence of the fall. What I'm very aware of is that sense of being abandoned, exiled from paradise, exiled from the very presence of God. And then when we live our life, we often live it from that perspective that we are somehow separated from God. And later on, we get this idea of sin. And that all of these sins that we have committed are what separate us from God. But I think it's way more than that. Because that separation from God happened in a sense before we had all these lists of sins to do. So Paul says sin was in the world before the law came. But it's, I think it's more than just these things that we do wrong. 
and it's more you know, we often will say that jesus died so that we could be forgiven but personally that that makes no sense to me whatsoever because one of the reasons that jesus was crucified and one of the reasons that he's gone through all this agony, not because that so that we could be forgiven, but because he was going around forgiving people. And that God has actually been in the forgiveness business since the beginning of time. And so that Jesus didn't have to die for our sins so that we would be forgiven which is, I think, what a lot of us have been taught. And for me today, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I think in years past it did, but for whatever reason today, it doesn't seem to make any difference because, as I said, Jesus was actually executed because he wouldn't stop forgiving people. Now, in a couple of days' time, we're going to get the rest of the story. And you and all know, I know it. It's the resurrection. And I think what the resurrection does is in this case, it vindicates what Jesus was doing. You see that forgiveness that I was talking about gave you and you were forgiven. You really were forgiven. So we come back to thinking what? did Jesus do? Because whatever he did, it is finished. Now we have the Easter story, and so we tend to look at all of this through the Easter story of the resurrection. And we are aware that God is going to have the last word in all things. And that last word that God has will be a word of love and it will be a word of life. But what we know is that whatever Jesus came to do, it is finished. We don't have to add to it. We don't have to do something else in order for whatever obstacle you have to thinking that you are separated from God. And I would say this is the ultimate ignorance of the world that we believe that we are separated from God. And that that is the great lie that we have been taught. That is our great ignorance, that we live from a place of belief and awareness that we are somehow separated from God. Now, I have... No idea how salvation, whatever you think salvation is, works. And you can come up with all sorts of theories, and I know I've lived all sorts of theories and what have you. Most of the theories, all of them, don't really work all that well for me. The thing that I find most helpful is the word atonement. Now, we can get bogged down and in getting into a whole lot of ideas of atoning for sin and all of those kinds of things, which I think is counterproductive. I think what's more helpful is just to look at the word atonement. It's actually three. At one meant for at one with. In Jesus, we are at one with God. Period. Full stop. It's finished done. It's a done deal. And frankly, I really, really don't care. And I'm tired of getting into endless arguments with people trying to figure it out and explain it. I'd rather just live it. 
and all the endless arguments keep us away from this incredible gift that we've been given. You and I, right now, in this very moment, are one with God. There is nothing else that you can do to make that a reality. Because it's true. Whether you open your heart to it, doesn't matter. You still are. You're inseparable from God. Because it's finished. There's nothing more to do. And the invitation is simply to wake up what it, to what is actually true. It's a done deal. And for me, one of my favorite passages is Paul's writing to the Colossians. And he says this incredible line. He says, your life, the very essence of your being, is hid with Christ in God. I think of the Lord's Prayer that we say. We say, our Father who art in heaven. And just if you think about the language of that, it's, it evokes this idea that we are here and God is up there, out there, somewhere in heaven. And clearly that means that there's a separation. Now, in the New Zealand prayer book, in the way that they've translated uh, the Lord's Prayer, we would actually rephrase the way we would say the Lord's Prayer and say, Our Father, in whom is heaven? That heaven is not a place that God inhabits. Heaven is in God. And I find that incredibly helpful. Our Father, in whom is heaven? And to know that you and I are hid with Christ in God, in that place we call heaven. Heaven's not a place to get to in the future. It's the reality in which you live right now, in the heart of God. That's what Jesus came to reveal. That's what the whole of his life was about. And people couldn't handle that and what he was calling people to do particularly forgiving people, really offended the people who were supposed to be teaching people about God's mercy and forgiveness. And so they handed him over to the Romans to execute him. And he was executed. I don't think he died for our sins. He died because obviously we are sinful and we, humanity, crucified him. He died in lots of ways because he wouldn't shut up about how we were forgiven and how he called for justice for all people to know that they were forgiven and live a forgiving life where we love one another, we love our enemies and we ensure that everyone has what they need to live. He wouldn't let it go. And that offended the people who were in power, whether it was religious or political authorities. Because they could never hold this idea that you're bad and God's against you, over your head and threaten you and intimidate you. 
and use religion to oppress you. It's finished. It's a done deal. There is nothing whatsoever that separates you from the love of God and Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so as we enter into our final silence today, I invite you to sit in the presence of the one who loves you. To know that you are hid with the one who has hung on this cross for the last three hours. That you are hid with him in the very heart of God. for all eternity. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your way, so Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. And you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimony. For your name's sake, O Lord, forgive my sin, for it is great. Who are they who fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They shall dwell in prosperity, and their offspring shall inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him and will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever looking to the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and have pity on me, for I am left alone and in misery. The sorrows of my heart have increased. Bring me out of my troubles. Look upon my adversity and misery and forgive me all my sin. Look upon my enemies, for they are many and they bear a violent hatred against me. Protect my life and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I have trusted in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for my hope has been in you. Deliver Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Let us pray, Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. Worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain, to receive all power and wealth, wisdom and might, honor and glory and praise. Praise and honor, glory and might to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. We pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord. And to our sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever.